Don't forget to be at the banquet tonight, Stan shouted my wife as she ran out the door. It really means a lot to my career. Don't worry, I'll be there, I promised. I finished my porridge, put the dishes in the sink, and put my cell phone on the table. Then I went back upstairs and changed into comfortable golf clothes. I threw my golf clubs and shoes into my car and drove off. I planned to meet up with a couple friends at a course in Kutztown, about 100 miles down the road. We got an 11.30 start. It was a beautiful fall day. There are some things in life you just can't buy. We finished the game at 3.30 p.m. and went into the clubhouse to eat. I hadn't seen Jack and Steve, two of my college buddies, in a few years, and we had a great time catching up. We ate and decided to play a few more holes. As we were having a great time, we finished, as it was getting dusk. That was awesome. Jack grinned as we finished playing. Do you have to leave right now, or can you have another drink with us? Stan, have I ever turned down a drink, especially from such an obliging loser? I laughed. Let's go to the watering hole. We drank a couple of beers, and we told old war stories from our glory days. I caught myself thinking I was having a good time, and I should see Jack and Steve more often. As we got closer to the house, I felt my mood slowly deteriorate. Brandy would be furious when I walked through the door. I would have to deal with her anger and consider the best way to extinguish it. I laughed to my myself when I realized I was thinking the impossible. She would be furious, where the hell have you been? Those were her words of greeting when I walked into the living room. I told you that this underscore underscore banquet was very important to me and for you to remember to be there by six. Sorry, darling, the boss sent me to Doylestown. Terrible traffic, I've just got back. I spoke to Tom. He was home at 6.30. He said you took time off work and didn't go to work. He also left his cell phone on the kitchen table so I couldn't contact you. Brandy yelled, you're a bad liar and a pathetic underscore underscore. Well, now that we have that settled, I give up, honey. I smiled. I'm exhausted. Settled. What's settled at this point? We've determined that you're lying to me. What about telling the truth? Demanded Brandy I was stolen along with my car by pirates. They took me to an old warehouse to hold me for ransom, but some aliens dragged me onto their ship and stuck their probes into my teeth, eyes, and genitals. I replied when they left the room. I was lucky enough to untie the knots in the rope they had tied me with. Then I had to figure out how to steer their ship I accidentally flew into. Scranton. Back I had to hitchhike with a trucker to get my car, but don't worry, I'm feeling pretty good, just a little tired. Brandy looked at me like I was crazy. She was so pissed off she couldn't even put words together into a meaningful sentence for a few seconds. Stan, what are you talking about? Stop bullshitting and tell me why you missed the banquet. You know, it was important to me I got a good promotion and you were supposed to be there with me. It was extremely embarrassing that you weren't there. Brandy wheezed through gritted teeth. I was playing golf with Jack and Steve, a couple of my old college buddies. I admitted they beat me at first, but I beat them by 30 feet on the seventh hole. I've been kicking their asses ever since this new putter is a work of art. I swear I've hit a few shots at 300 yards golf, Brandy repeated incredulously. You knew this dinner was very important to me, and you played golf. You planned it days in advance, didn't you? So why did you tell me you were going to be at my event if you weren't going to be there? I didn't want to hurt you. So I lied a little. I was hoping you wouldn't find out. I suggested wouldn't find out. You didn't want to hurt me. Are you out of your mind? Stan Brandy asked, How could I not notice that damn empty chair, you idiot? How did you not mean to offend me by not attending such an important event for me? In retrospect, I realized you had to guess, I admitted. But at the time, it seemed exciting and somehow different. It just happened. I never meant to hurt you. It's just golf. Nothing personal. Are you drunk or something? Did you and your old buddy smoke a joint? Stan Brandy asked you sound like you're out of your mind. I'm too tired to discuss your selfish, nasty behavior tonight. You can sleep in one of the old nursery rooms. I don't want you to touch me or even talk to me for a while. No problem, honey. I'll be quiet as a mouse. I promised Brandy stared at me like I was some kind of insect she'd never seen before. I smiled and headed for Brian's room. Brandy and I had been married for 24 years. Both of our children were in college and we were adjusting to the empty nest. I climbed into Brian's bed and fell fast asleep repeating my best beats in my sleep. The next next morning I was dressed for work reading the paper and eating cereal when Brandy walked into the kitchen. Don't think I'm done with you, Stan, she warned. I don't know how or if you'll ever be able to make up to me for yesterday. I think you need to think about that yourself. I'll be working late tonight, so start your penance by cooking yourself dinner. 
No problem, sweetie. I can take care of myself. I replied. Have a good time. I'm going to work. What do you mean, have a good time? Brandy demanded answer. Have a good day. Be happy. Don't worry about me. Don't take any wooden nickels, whatever it was. Just a steady expression. She looked at me like I had two heads, then turned and walked off to work. I picked up the phone and dialed my work number. I told them I wasn't feeling well and wouldn't be coming in today. I spent the morning shopping. I finally saw something I wanted at BSTU and ordered the biggest, underscore, underscore, flat screen TV on the planet. I had it delivered the same day everything was set up and working perfectly in time for the evening news. It worked so well that I kept trying to look into the anchor woman's cleavage. I felt like she was in the room with me. The TV took up an entire wall in the living room. It even made the closet door inaccessible, but it was worth it. I called a few guys from work and invited them over to watch the first game of the World Series, then ordered some pizza and ribs at another place down the road. When Brandy walked into the room, we were watching the third pitch to say she looked surprised would be a huge understatement. She was actually at a loss for words. Harry, our accounting guy, saw her jumped up, grabbed her hand, and shook it. Congratulations on the promotion that TV is really cool. Old Stan's a lucky guy to have a wife like you. He raved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brandy hesitated. I'm really tired, so I'm going to leave you guys to watch the game and go to bed. What was that? She really took it well. I wondered how angry she would be in the morning I was dressed for work and reading the morning paper when Brandy walked into the kitchen. You're going to get that damn monster out of here and back to the store before I get home from work tonight. Can you hear me? Stan Brandy shouted. I can hear you, honey. No need to raise your voice. I grinned. I'm not deaf. The door slammed so hard I thought the glass in the windows would shatter. She was hard to understand. At times I was watching Cheers when Brandy walked into the living room tonight. I thought I told you to turn that thing today, she began. You said you heard me and that I didn't need to raise my voice now. I come home and the thing is still here, she shouted. What part didn't you understand, you idiot? I've never understood why Norm is on this show. I replied, he's not very funny, foam, and saliva flew out of Bry's mouth as she tried to formulate a coherent sentence. Her face turned crimson. Stan, listen to me. I wanted you to return the TV, but you didn't. I didn't buy this thing to return it, honey. I smiled. I like it, and I'm going to keep it. I understood the words you spoke this morning. The problem you're facing right now is that I didn't follow your orders. Not that I didn't understand your words. It never occurred to Brandy that I would refuse to follow her direct order. This was new territory, and she was caught completely off guard. What's happened to you lately, Stan? You miss an important event by making underscore, underscore, excuses. And then you order a huge, and I'm sure very expensive, television without discussing it with me. Are you feeling okay? She asked a little anxiously. I'm feeling fine, darling. Thank you for asking. I knew that if I had asked about the TV, you would have said it was a bad idea to save myself the heartache and not start an argument. I just ordered it. It's a lot easier and it doesn't hurt anyone. I added nobody, Stan. It hurts like hell. Brandy growled. This is really upsetting me. This thing is too big for the room. I can't even get a vacuum cleaner. You spent a lot of money on something that really doesn't fit our house and didn't consult me. How could you think it wouldn't hurt anyone when you say that... I know what you mean. I can't do something just because it will make me happy and not think about how it will affect you. Can I? That's exactly right, Stan. You've never done anything like this before. Why do you need to be taught all over again? Brandy asked. You're acting like a selfish child. I think you're right. I'll return the TV on Monday. Okay, I replied. I'd rather you did it tomorrow. Stan, I have to go to work tomorrow afternoon for a few hours working on Saturday is frustrating, but that's why I got the promotion. Brandy reasoned, please get him out of here when I get back tomorrow night. I nodded in agreement and went back to looking around at Shelley Long. I'd always had fantasies starring her Saturday afternoon. I called Bry's parents and invited them to have lunch with me. When we arrived at the cafe, I introduced everyone to Cindy Walsh, who was waiting there for me. Cindy looked tired and exhausted and I wondered if she would be able to get by, normally. Bry's parents paid no attention to anything but the free lunch I treated them to at three o'clock. We followed Cindy to her house and parked behind her in the driveway. Cindy offered us seats in her tastefully decorated living room. We sat there with Bry's parents. Then Cindy walked over to the security system remote and pressed a few buttons. The noise was deafening. 
Sirens howled, and a loud voice warned all intruders to leave the building immediately. It was quite intimidating. Suddenly, the door swung open and Cindy's husband, Charles, ran into the room with a bat he was completely naked and in a state of semi-excitement not recognizing because he didn't know either Bry's parents or me. He swung the bat at us threateningly. Cindy remained out of his sight. Get the hell out of here before I beat your brains out, he shouted. Get the hell out of here. He pulled the bat back for a second. I thought I should pitch to him. Then he was stopped by a scream. Mom, Dad, Stan, what are you doing here? Bry's parents looked away from the naked baseball player and saw Brandy standing in the doorway pressing a sheet against his obviously naked body. I invited them here to have some fun. Mrs. Burns, Cindy replied as she entered the room, Charles was never good at hiding his affairs. I knew he brought a underscore underscore into our house when I told him I had to go to Philadelphia for the weekend. I even guessed it would be you, Mrs. Burns, after seeing how attentive he was to you last night at the banquet. I stood up and nodded to Bry's parents. I walked over to Cindy and shook her hand. Then I shifted my gaze from Bry's new boss, Charles, to Brandy herself, Notre Dame, is playing tonight, and I don't want to miss it on my big screen. When you're done, you're taking your parents home, right? Brandy, I asked. I'm sure they won't mind. Well, wait a little. I'll get some underscore underscore out of the house during the commercial, but it won't be the TV. The game was over and I carried all of Bry's clothes down the hall and into the living room. Then she meekly walked through the door, looked at all her personal belongings and odd Stan, please don't do this. It was just an affair, nothing more. I never meant for you to get hurt. You weren't supposed to find out about anything. You're supposed to trust me. We've had too many years together to throw it all away like that. She pleaded not to find out. How could I not notice that damn empty chair, you idiot? I asked, pointing to the chair. This marriage was very important to me. And you just went and cheated. I love you, not him, Stan. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. It doesn't really matter anymore. You were furious when I played golf during an event that was very important to you. Your words, not mine, sleeping with your boss is a little worse than wasting time on holes, isn't it, Brandy? I'm suffering, believe me, Stan. My dad called me all kinds of names. They think I'm a cheap... Underscore, underscore. And I can't work with Charles again. Can't we put my affair behind us? Brandy begged your sex with another man is something I can put behind me. Brandy, I replied calmly. I saw her eyes glisten at my words, but then tears welled up as I finished my thought. I can't get past the lies, the disrespect, and the inability to trust you. You've tasted something like that from me over the past few days, days. It's impossible to live with a man like that, isn't it? Take your bed, Brandy. My lawyer will contact you on Monday. The TV stays and you don't. You? What signs can you recognize if your wife is cheating on you? Was it a sudden change in her mood? Or did she start leaving the house in the evenings to go out? Did she say she always wanted to have fun with the girls or something else out of those hundreds of little things worth paying attention to? As for me, well, let's just say it was just a keen intuition. When I came home from work, she was on the phone. And as soon as I crossed the threshold, she hurriedly said, I gotta go, he's home. Bye, and immediately pressed off, looking at me innocently. That was all it took for that horrible, guttering suspicion to flare up inside me. I thought about asking her who she was talking to, but she could make up anything, couldn't she? Like that, she was chatting with a salesman from the couch store to order two marvelous massagers for the relentless war on cellulite for the price of one. That kind of thought couldn't have just popped into my head out of the blue, right? There must have been a worm of doubt inside my mind about my wife for some time now. I didn't like it myself, and I didn't want it to keep gnawing at me day after day. I'm not good with change in my life. I guess you could say I'm one of those old-fashioned guys who stick to the principle of it's better to stay out of something that's working fine, lest you break it and make it worse than it was. I guess it's time to introduce myself and tell you about my family. I'm Ron, and Cindy and I have been safely married for 24 years. We have four children, two adults, and two teenagers. We're not millionaires, but what we have now is enough to make a decent living. At least we don't have any debts to anyone. Cindy and I own a comfortable little house, and the mortgage is paid off. Our cars may not be brand new, but we don't have to pay monthly payments on them. We probably still have a few small credit card debts, but that's about it. So all in all, we are an average American family and we try to live within our means. Every weekday we work, we eat, 
We take care of our house, the younger kids go to school, and on weekends we sometimes go out as a family. Likewise, Cindy and I try to keep up with everything our kids are into, whether it's sports, art classes, scouting, or any other activity they are involved in. Sometimes we even have dinner all together around a common table in our close-knit family circle, which in these times you might say is a rarity. Cindy and I have a sex life that is probably the same as most middle-aged people. We make love once every two weeks or so. I might wish it were much more frequent, but you know it takes two to do the horizontal tango. And lately, Cindy has been, shall we say, not so keen on that kind of dancing. That was a pun, if anything. Because of my stupid supernatural intuition, I'm afraid I'm now going to have to be on the lookout for any strange signs from Cindy. It's like I don't trust her anymore for no apparent reason. I'm just hoping that this nagging knot twisting inside my stomach is just normal indigestion and not a harbinger of what I suspect. My main problem is that I'm not a super sleuth or a seven. I'm just an average middle-aged man who doesn't know much about all the fancy hidden video cameras, phone tapping, computer hacking, and other spy stuff you may have heard or read about. And on top of all that, I'm not rich enough to be able to hire a private investigator to follow my wife. Especially since I have no idea where I'm supposed to dig or what I'm looking for. Cindy handles all of our finances, so I have no idea how much she pays to whom or when. If I suddenly start going through all the paperwork, I'm sure she'll notice and will want to know why I'm suddenly buried in bills and receipts. What am I supposed to say to her? Honey, I've got some suspicious heaviness in my stomach. You're growing horns for me, is that it? Yeah, and she's like, honey, I bet you'd rather go for a piss than do that shit. A little family history. Our marriage seems pretty normal, as it probably should be at this point in life and at our age. I met Cindy when we were both in our early 20s, dated for about a year, and then got married about once every two years. She had a baby when the number of children reached four. I got a little tired of the babies popping out of Cindy like those moles in a slot machine. So I had a vasectomy shortly after her last birth. So it was one of those nights when everyone who lives in our house, the two teenagers, my wife and I, had dinner together. The kids talked a little about their day at school, and Cindy told us about her part-time job at the library. I should say that after our two youngest started college, Cindy got a little bored with being home alone, and after a while got a job at the local library. That's where she worked part-time, and her work schedule was irregular. Maybe the library was one of those places I needed to check out. But how was I supposed to do that? It's not like I could just take a day off work to sit right in front of the entrance to the fucking library and watch who goes in and out of there and who Cindy chats with. Hell, then it'd be every first timer in the damn place. She's a librarian. It's her job to talk to the smart ones every time. Well, fuck the library. I got a better idea where I can catch her. She was going to her women's card club tonight, so I guess I could start my private investigation right after she left the house. To do that, I'd have to covertly follow her in my good old pickup truck. Oh, come on, you're yelling that I'm on the verge of getting caught again. I can hardly afford a rental car, as husbands on the trail almost always easily do in all those stories about cheating wives. Anyway, Cindy left to cut cards, and I quietly slipped out of the house a few minutes after her. I knew where she was going because she told me so herself, and even left a phone number where I could reach her if I needed to talk to her. I lost her car, or rather it had somehow gotten ripped off on the way while I was stuck. So I just drove to Marge's house, where I knew this womanizing poker tournament was going to be held. When I got there, I saw Cindy's car among the other autos parked in front of her friend Marge's house. I waited a few minutes, scanning the street to make sure no one else would show up, and then I got out of my pickup truck, which I'd parked a couple houses away from my target, crept up to one of the windows and peered cautiously inside. When I craned my neck to peer into the back of the room, I saw two card tables with four women sitting at each table and playing cards. Some of them were smoking, others were periodically sampling the drinks on the table, and all of them seemed to be chatting enthusiastically with each other, slapping cards on the table and occasionally bursting out laughing. Shit cards, money, and no guns. Just eight giggling broads in the room, no stallion with a foot-long dick, and no debauchery whatsoever. And I was already anticipating that I would descend upon this nest of whoremongers and put a stop to their unbridled bacchanalia. My investigation was at a standstill, so I slowly backed up to get back to my pickup truck. 
Of course, by the law of meanness, as soon as I started to back up, I stepped in a pile of dog shit. Pure rock, I said through gritted teeth, waddling sideways like a drunken crab on thickly greased shoes toward the truck. Goddamn shitting dogs and dog-owning hoopos who feed their mutts and then let them run around. And good unsuspecting guys, as a result, have to deal with the demining of the left surprises. Anyway, I had to clean dog shit off my shoes for about ten minutes before I could get back in my truck. Holy crap, they still stunk. It was a good thing I opened all the windows, increased my speed, and managed not to get in the way of the inspector, or he would have given me a ticket for the particularly stinky environmental plume behind me. Well, the first outing ended in a fiasco, but I didn't give up. My stomach, like a trusty compass, was telling me that treason was close at hand. When I got home and quickly threw off my shit suits, I went to the laundry basket and looked for my wife's bras and panties. Good thing she hasn't done her laundry this week. I can smell I'm on the right track. Taking her panties out of the hamper, I carefully felt their entire crotch and held the gusset up to my nose. Bruh, they stink. Hey, shut up. I don't give a shit what you're saying. Use panties that have been in the hamper for days stink. Period. Whether they're from the crotch of a respectable family woman or a fun-loving hottie, it doesn't matter. It's not at all the same when you're horny and dive your nose between your woman's legs. Everything smells good during sex, but those pieces of fabric with whitish streaks and yellow spots that had been in the basket for almost a week and now swayed in front of my nose smelled not even lilies or violets. All right, let the wife's panties be a bummer. Let's move on. I went through her closet looking for revealing dresses and clothes that looked inappropriate. Then I went through every drawer in her dresser. Nothing suspicious, just zero. I found a binder of invoices lying in the file cabinet in the office. I flipped through the fucking bills until the damn numbers were bouncing around in front of my eyes like balls in a lotto drum. Once again, I found nothing out of the ordinary, unless you counted the hole in the bagel. Mother. Of all honesty, Cindy was good at hiding evidence. For a cheating wife, she was great. I got on the computer and entered her password into a pop-up window. She had told me the keyword a long time ago. Plus, just to be sure, we had printed it out and hung it next to the computer on the wall. I went through all of Cindy's emails, which, come to think of it, was pretty stupid, since she and I shared an account, and we'd both used the same email address for years. If there was any dirt in there, I would have noticed it long ago. Not surprisingly, poking back and forth in the mail, I couldn't find a damn thing to think of. It another dead end. Shit, shit, shit. I've been digging around for three hours trying to find anything against Cindy, but I've got nothing. And when I read all these cheating stories on my computer, there's always some shit in them. Secret phone records, motel bills, dropped panties, unexplained spending handprints on asses and tits, and a million other clues. In these stories, they hire super-duper sneaky private investigators. They install clever phone-tapping devices. Then the cheating wives track down their walker husbands. Then the suddenly enlightened husbands catch their slutty broads. Oh yeah, they also make sure to take crisp color photos of cheaters practicing the Kama Sutra, shoot expository videos, and even catch strange men in the marital bed. Who, where is all this stuff, I ask you? If I can't find shit, my Cindy must be a master at cover-ups and double-dealing. Just as I gave up and started to clean up my mess, the front door opened and Cindy walked in. I was kneeling in front of the laundry basket, holding her dirty panties in both hands. I froze in place. She froze looking at me. I don't know whose eyes were bigger, but hers were definitely like cat saucers. Okay, Ron, I think it's time we had a talk, she said slowly, keeping her gaze on me and approaching cautiously along the wall. You followed me to Mars, and then I saw your face peering out from behind the jam of the open window. Then I heard you grunting somewhere in the darkness. Did you step in some dog poop? She sniffed the air with her nose. Oh yeah, that's right. So that's where Marge lets her doggy do her dirty deeds. Doggy? Oh really? Judging by the pile I'm in, Marge is not a pet dog. She's King Kong. He's probably grinning his teeth at me from his kennel after I blew up his landmine. I was still sitting there with a stupid smile on my face, a pair of underpants in my hands and my eyes wandering back and forth. There was no way out. The skin on my face and neck felt hot. For some reason my throat was dry and in general I suddenly lost the gift of English speech. 
Now I come home and I see you sitting there sniffing my dirty laundry. If I didn't know you better, I'd think you didn't trust me. Do you really think I'm cheating on you, Ron? Yeah. I don't know, Cindy. I have this bad gut feeling and I've been having this all day since this morning, I stammered, mumbling something in my defense. Come with me, honey, and let's talk. My wife turned and walked toward the living room. I threw the laundry in the hamper, got up and followed her, landing on the couch. Cindy sat down next to me, folded her hands in her lap and looked at me intently. Were you reading erotic stories again on your lunch break at work? She asked rather shrewdly. I nodded embarrassedly. Well, yes. And there were stories about cheating wives, Cindy asked. You guessed it. I sighed again. Tell me, did you think of me when you read all those stories about cheating wives? Of course I did, I mumbled, averting my gaze to the side. Otherwise, I wouldn't have followed you to Mars tonight. I besides, when I got home from work, you were on the phone. You were on the phone with someone, and as soon as I walked in, you hurriedly said, I gotta go and hung up. Why don't you explain? I went on the offensive. Cindy looked at me with raised eyebrows and smiled broadly, shaking her head. God, I don't even know if I should be mad at you or just hug you. She grinned. I frowned and stared back at her and said still, who were you talking to when I walked in? Please don't lie to me. I wasn't going to. She shrugged. Actually, I was talking to your mother. She calls me almost every day, as you probably know. Wait, that call was the reason for your big investigation? Oh, geez, Clinton. Now I felt stupid. Not for the first time today, though. How could I have forgotten about my mom? Another one of my phone. Happy moms. Cindy tilted her head to the side and smiled slyly at my guilty conscience. Then she moved closer and put her hands on top of mine, squeezing them lightly. Ron, darling, tell me honestly, have I ever done anything to make you suspicious or distrustful of me? No, I admitted. It was just my gut feeling. Honey. Cindy continued to smile. You're a miracle. If I didn't love you so much, I'd probably freak out at the numbers you're pulling. She wrapped her hands around my cheeks and said the next words, looking me straight in the eye. You're my favorite man, the one and only. No matter how weird you are, sometimes I love you with all my heart, even if I don't say it often enough. Maybe we don't make love enough, but we can fix that. And the best thing to do is to do it right now. With those words, she took my hand and led me into the bedroom, locked the door, dimmed the lights, and then began undressing me. So, do you feel better now? With sly demons bouncing in her eyes, she asked. Cindy, I replied, turning my head on its side and again stroking her tantalizing curves with my gaze. You're the best and I love you. But what about those warning signals coming from my gut? She smiled, then giggled, and finally just started laughing, uncontrollably. Holding her stomach with one hand and wiping away tears with the other, Cindy pulled a blister of pills out of the medicine cabinet and tossed it on my bed. Here, take two of these. Honey, you only have indigestion, she said as soon as I popped the wheels and froze. Listening to the rumbling response of my stomach, my wife gave me a stern look and added, And honey, please stop sniffing my dirty underwear. It's disgusting. I agree. What the hell? When Cindy's right, she's right. Ron Wiseman couldn't wait to get home to Amy, his beloved wife of 10 years. She was not only a beautiful woman who kept herself in great shape, but also a fantastic cook and the best lover a man could wish for the day before Amy said she wanted to invite her new boss, Mike Armstrong, to her house for dinner. She said he wanted to get to know her husband and get a feel for her family. Ron didn't see anything wrong with that, and said he would like to meet her new boss, especially since the last two incumbents didn't last long and left under somewhat mysterious circumstances the most recent incumbent quit after only a few months on the job, saying he needed to take an extended sabbatical in Sri Lanka to find himself, and the man who worked before him was found decapitated in his garage with his hands tied behind his back. Police said it was a suicide, but his genitals, which had been surgically removed, were never found. Ron noticed the time and texted his wife before locking his office, letting her know he was on his way. Her reply came instantly. I'll see you soon, love you. Ron said goodbye to his secretary and headed home, stopping only to buy a bouquet of roses for his wife. He liked doing things like that to surprise her, and she liked receiving gifts of love from him.
She also liked to thank him for the little gifts Ron turned down the driveway to his house, noticing the black Mercedes at the curb in front of his house. At least this man had the sense to stay out of my driveway. Ron thought he entered the house and saw a well-dressed man of about 45 sitting on the couch. Ron glanced at him. He was quite tall, seemed well-built with a slight gray on his temples. He was clean-shaven, and his face seemed to have one of those perpetual smirks playing on it. He stood up with a wry smile on his face as Ron entered the room and held out his hand. Ron shook it before apologizing. He went to the kitchen and handed Amy the bouquet before enclosing her in a hug. Her face brightened as she accepted Ed the flowers. I'll have to properly thank you for this later, she whispered. Ron kissed his wife's pretty face, placing his hand on her ass. Now be a good host and go say hello to Mike. She said Ron kissed her again and went back into the living room. He walked over to his drink bar and offered Mike a shot of whiskey, which he accepted. The two men sat down in the living room after Ron had poured the liquor. What a wife you have, Mike said, and his crooked smile became even more noticeable. I have to agree. Ron said she's the meaning of my life then. I think you'll understand why I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Mike said, really, Ron asked, what is it? I'm going to sleep with your wife, said Mike. She's going to love it and you're going to watch. Hold that thought for a second. Ron said, I'll be right back. He made his way to the kitchen. I'm going to show Mike around the neighborhood a little, he said, said, Weck, be right back. Amy gave him an understanding look. Don't be long, dear, she said. Dinner will be ready in about 15 or 20 minutes. Great, Ron said he went back to the front room. I hope you didn't tell your wife what I said, Mike said. Ron shook his head. No, no, Ron said, let him go into my cave, okay? He said, gesturing for Mike to follow him. Mike got up and followed Ron into his office, also known as his personal man cave. Mike looked around at what was hung on the walls in addition to pictures. There were several official commendations, medals, knives, and guns, and a few swords hanging on the wall. So you're going to sleep with my wife, aren't you? Ron asked. Mike nodded his head. Yeah, I'm gonna, he said, grinning. Do you have a problem with that? I take it my wife never told you about me. Ron said she told me you were an accountant doing research for some special task force. He said, yes. Ron said it's true that I'm a CPA. And yes, I do work for a joint federal and private task force, but I wasn't always an accountant. Oh, Mike said Ron pointed to items on the wall. You know, I was in the army once I was a scout sniper at the time. Ron said most of my 150 confirmed sniper kills were from 300, 600 M away, but I've successfully hit targets as far away as 1,200 M that's over a kilometer. And at that distance, you never hear a shot. One second you're alive and breathing, the next you're dead. He pulled out a desk drawer and ran his hands over his knife collection. Mike wasn't very comfortable by this time, and it got worse when Ron pulled out one very large knife. I'm also perfectly fine with close range kills, he said, holding the sharp blade where Mike could see it. There's nothing like seeing your enemy emit his last breath up close and personal. Mike's face turned turned white and the smirk disappeared. Look, Ron, there's nothing personal about this, Mike muttered. Oh, but it is. Mike Ron said you just told me you were going to sleep with my wife, and you expect me to watch. That makes it very personal to me. I just want you to know what you're risking. You see, I believe in the old adage that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'm sure you understand. He looked at his watch. Oh, I think dinner's about ready. We'd better get back, he said. Mike nodded his head and watched in horror as Ron threw a knife at a thick target on the far wall. The knife hit exactly in the center before plunging halfway through. I like practicing, Ron said to Amy's ash pale boss. They headed into the dining room where Amy set a table for three for them, placing the bouquet Ron had brought home in the center. As always, she seated Ron at the head of the table, Mike to his left and herself to his right. They sat down and Ron took Amic hand. He held out his hand to Mike. We like to say a prayer before we eat, he said. Mike gently took Ron's hand. Amy and Ron bowed their heads and closed their eyes. Mike followed suit, not knowing what to expect. Lord Ron said, thank you for this food we are about to eat. Thank you for your many blessings for our home and our family. May you continue to bless us with your wisdom and grace. Amen, I hope everyone enjoys this, Amy said as she opened the plates to reveal succulent Cornish hen, one of Ron's favorite dishes. 
I started cooking it over low heat this morning. It's delicious, honey, Ron said, taking a big bite. Don't you agree? Mike Mike nodded nervously in agreement. Yes, it's delicious, he said. Oh, a wonderful cook. Amy Ron noticed that Mike was looking at him nervously as he complimented Amy on her cooking. Don't worry, Mike. He said I never kill anyone at the dinner table, do I, darling? Mike's face went pale as Amy nodded approvingly. Not without good reason, she said it can get quite messy and I really don't like having to clean blood off the tablecloth. She added, after all, it's over 100 years old, by the way. Honey Ron said Mike told me that he plans to sleep with you and he wants me to watch. Did you know anything about that? Did you? Amy asked, no. He never said anything to me about it. She looked at Mike. Is it true? Mike, are you planning to sleep with me? Please, Amy, I didn't say that. Maybe your husband misunderstood me. Mike said, shaking his head. Ron pulled out a tiny digital recorder and pressed a button. I'm going to sleep with your pretty wife. Mike's voice said, Sheck going to love it, and you're going to watch Mike's face turned red as Amy shook her head. What's the matter with you? Amy asked. We welcome you into our home feed. You offer our hospitality, and this is how you repay us, please. Mike said it was just a joke. I was just kidding. Well, that's it, honey. Ron said he was only joking. I don't know. She said, what's the punchline? I'm not laughing. Look, that's not what I meant. Mike said, raising his hands, really is that what you said to the husband of the last wife you slept with? Ron asked, what are you talking about? Mike asked, I told you I'm a researcher. I you out when Amy told me about you said Ron. According to my research, you were quietly fired from Acme Enterprises three months ago after you were named as the defendant in a civil suit for alienation of affection. The man who filed that suit was the husband of the woman he divorced after he caught the two of you naked in a hotel room. Mike lowered his gaze to his plate. Is it true? Amy asked Mikey's. Mike said quietly, I've done some things I'm not proud of, but that's all in the past. Speaking of the past, said Ron, I also learned that Mike's ex-wife was so tired of his cheating that she turned to a group called the Marriage Mutual Insurance Society, or MMAs. Isn't that true, Mike? Yes, it's true. He said I even saw the videotape of the punishment she was going to give him. Ron told Amy, pretty brutal. Actually, I would have thought it would make you change your habits. But that didn't happen, did it? Mike. Mike looked at him shocked. How do you know about that? He asked. It was supposed to be a secret. Mike Mike Ron said, shaking his head. I told you I'm a researcher. I have access to information. You wouldn't believe it was my task force that interceded on your wife's behalf. Don't you remember? Ron looked at Amy after we contacted his wife. She agreed to give him a choice. Either he would accept the punishment and stay in the marriage, or he would agree to a fair divorce settlement. I guess he didn't want that humiliation, so he agreed to the divorce. Ron looked back at Mike. You know, you really dodged a bullet with that one. He said, what kind of punishment was she going to give him? Amy asked brutal stuff. Said Ron Mike would have been tied up and severely beaten. He would be forced to watch his wife sleep with several men. Not a very pleasant picture. H.M., Amy asked, branded. Huh. Yeah, said Ron right on his ass. Slowly, Mike wrinkled his nose at the memory, and your group saved his ass. Amy asked. Ron nodded his head. Unfortunately, obviously, he hasn't learned his lesson. Ron said, maybe we should teach him that lesson, said Amy here tonight. Ron nodded his head. Maybe you're onto something, honey, he said. He looked at Mike, who was shaking his head furiously. No, please don't do this, he pleaded, shifting his gaze from Ron to Amy. Why not? Ron asked. Obviously, you didn't get the message before. Maybe we should teach you that it's not nice to sleep with other people's wives. I still have your ex-wife's number. Maybe we should invite her over to help teach you a lesson, and I have a lot of things I could use to cause you a lot of pain. Ron looked at Amy. You know, I still have that knife-throwing board in the basement. He said, what are you talking about, Mike said. You know, one of those moving boards used in the art of knife-throwing. You've probably seen them an assistant. Usually a half-naked woman is sometimes strapped to the board, and the thrower has to get the knives as close as possible without hitting her. I think it was called the Wheel of Death. We can strip Mike naked. Tie him spread eagle to the board and see how close we can get to his balls without cutting them off. He said he looked at Mike. Wouldn't that be fun? He asked. You know, Amy's pretty good at throwing knives, too, but not as good as me. Isn't that the board that spins? Amy asked. Ron nodded his head. Oh, yeah, that would be fun. We can place bets to see who gets closest. She looked at Mike. Oh, come on, Mike. That would be awesome. 
Mike jumped up from his chair and his face was white, his eyes wide open and his body physically shaking with terror. No, he said, you people are crazy. Look, it was just a joke. Please forget I said anything. He tried to turn away, but Ron grabbed him, spun him around and pinned him against the wall, keeping his hand on Mike's throat. Amy joined him with a two-edged serving fork in her hands. Sorry, buddy, we're not laughing, Ron said. Please, Mike pleaded. What do I have to do to make it stop? That's easy, said Ron. From now on, you will forget any thought of having my wife or any wife other than your own, and you'll be the epitome of professionalism. There will be no late nights and certainly no business trips out of town with Amy if I'm not there, and you'll treat every woman with the respect she deserves. That's it, Mike asked. Ron nodded. Yes, pretty much, Ron said. Just know that I'll be watching, and if you screw up, you'll pay the price. You should have paid a long time ago, understand? Mike nodded his head. Good. Now is there anything you want to tell us? Mike nodded his head again. I'm sorry, I really am. I will never do anything like that to anyone else. He said, please accept my apology and forgive me. Ron looked at his wife. What do you think, darling? He asked. Should we forgive him? Well, darling, she said, we do believe in forgiveness. So yes, we will forgive him this time. Ron loosened his grip on Mike's throat. He looked at his wife. So what are we having for dessert? He asked. I made a really good cheesecake, she said. Would you boys like a piece? Ron looked at Mike, who was shaking with terror. Well, how about some dessert? He asked Mike, who shook his head. Uh, no, thanks, he said. I, uh, really need to get home. Ron noticed that Amy was looking at Mike's pants, and he lowered his gaze. He saw the wet spot on Mike's crotch and shook his head. Yeah, I can see why you needed to go home, Ron said, noticing the smell coming from Mike's pants go on. Get out of here and remember what I said I will. Mike said heading for the front door, they both noticed a wet spot on the back of his pants as he headed for the exit. Can you believe he actually, underscore, underscore, his pants? Ron asked. Yeah, disgusting, isn't it? Amy said in response, and he actually thought he was going to sleep with me. Maybe I should bring him a box of candy tomorrow. Ron laughed, hearing the squeal of tires. Ron turned to his pretty wife. Do you think this cheesecake will hold up until tomorrow? Ron asked. Amy nodded her head. Oh yeah, she said, let's clean up this mess and then we'll finish dessert upstairs, okay?